What's up, everybody? It's Peter Tragos, the lawyer you know. And on this channel, we break down the trials and cases you care most about so you can understand how the American civil and criminal justice system works. And we try to make sure you understand what your rights are in every situation, which is why we try to walk you through the entire legal process while also answering your insightful questions along the way. And while it's not legal advice, it's always exciting. So buckle up for another episode of The Lawyer You Know. Waste. Hello, everybody. What's up and welcome in to another episode of The Lawyer You Know. Today we're talking Murdoch. We've been talking a lot of cases this week already, right? I mean, we've talked about Brian Koberger and the Idaho case multiple times. We've talked about Sarah Boone. A lot of questions coming in on Gabby Petito. I haven't had time to even look into that yet, but it's pretty wild. And then, of course, we've been following this Murdoch case. It's day two of jury selection. And while the jury selection wasn't incredibly interesting, it was incredibly interesting to watch and listen to the motion argument afterwards and to see some of the decisions that the judge made, but more importantly, the decisions that the judge did not make and what that means and what it could indicate going forward. And there's actually a couple of things the judge did that I disagree with. Seems like an amazing judge so far, just to start off with that. But there's a couple of things I disagree with. And I, I think that that kind of hits to why um, every jurisdiction is different. Um, and I meant to look up something about this jurisdiction and I forgot. But again, there's so much going on in the world today of legal news. So if you're here every night, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. We are almost to 190,000 subscribers. Maybe we can hit it on this live. If all of you that have not subscribed yet, hit that button. And later on, we may put up the counter to see how close we get if we can hit it during this live. But let's get into what happened during jury selection. The judge finished his initial questions. And people have been telling me that reports are coming through that um, the lawyers don't ask any questions in this judge's courtroom. They just submit the questions to the judge, which I think will actually make jury selection go a little quicker. I don't love that. I don't think that's the best way to pick a jury. I like for the lawyers to talk to the jury, to have the jury get to know the lawyers. Like my wife said yesterday when she said, you know, she felt like she was able to get to know the lawyers, their personality a little bit. I, to me, after talking to her, it feels like she trusted them. She thought they were both pretty good guys, pretty good lawyers after listening to them in jury selection. And I like that as kind of the breaking the ice at the beginning of the case. And, but they don't do that in this jurisdiction. It's a lot like federal court. And I've tried a lot of cases in federal court, most of them criminal, a couple civil. And I hate that experience compared to civil court in state court. Um, in criminal court, oh, all right, so we've got the counter that might come up a little bit later. Not right now. Um, okay, so we've got uh, a situation where the lawyers don't get to dig in as much as they'd like. No judge digs in like a lawyer would dig in in the jury selection process, yet that's what it seems like is going to happen here. I did hear during the same questions that we heard yesterday, a lot more people mentioned YouTube today as how they've heard about this case and whether or not they've had um, some experiences or thoughts about this case already based on things they heard on YouTube. I don't know who they're listening to, but probably some of the usual suspects like the big shots like Emily Baker um, and some of the big channels that are streaming and talking about this case. So I wonder what opinions they have formed based on listening to those YouTube channels. It feels like this is kind of plenty weird. Okay. So I thought that was interesting. Uh, Murdoch's lawyers, there were a couple people that the judge was ready to excuse and the state was ready to excuse, but Murdoch's lawyers, Murdoch's lawyers wanted to follow up with more questions. So we'll see more from them later on. So these jurors, and I was kind of shocked to hear how many jurors were left because it seemed like there were literally hundreds of jurors that they went through over the last day and a half and only 123 jurors were left. So while that's actually a lot, because most of my trials, we have somewhere between 35 and 50 or 30 and 50 jurors, I'd say that we get to pick from. 123. That's a lot of jurors that are pre-qualified basically and don't have any of the guaranteed knocks just that they're not able to show up or they know too much about the case. I still think there are going to be some that do know about this case and they're going to dig into it more. And there were some that knew or even like were semi-related tangentially to Alec Murdoch. 
and Murdoch's team wanted them to stay. And so they are going to stay and there will be more follow-up questions. So, so we will see how that continues with 123 jurors that are showing up tomorrow at 11 a.m. And what's interesting is we're not going to show up at nine. And the lawyers even asked at the end because there's nothing else to really do at this point, which leads me into the arguments that were made on the motions that are still pending in this case. And it's not uncommon. It is wild, but it's not uncommon when things like motive, which took the prosecutor over an hour to explain in a prior hearing, that's going to take days of testimony to prove this financial crime cover-up motive. And we don't even know if it's going to come in the case, but that's where we're going to start because that was one of the motions that was discussed. And the judge said to the prosecutor, you're asking me to do a reverse motion in limine. Usually a motion in limine is asking to exclude something from coming in in trial. You're asking me to say it's allowed already. That's unusual. I'm not going to do that. So the judge didn't say no. You can't bring that evidence of motive in. He didn't say yes. You can bring that evidence of motive in. He said, I'm not going to make a call right now which to me indicates a couple of things. The defense could have filed the motion limiting to keep all that stuff out. And then the judge would have potentially had to make a call or the defense is planning on objecting to it one at a time as things come in. So to me, that leaves everybody kind of in a difficult spot. How much are they going to be able to get into? Harpoolian was arguing a motion about they can't get into certain financial information and whether or not he was collectible because he was making an argument that this was similar to, you know, when you ask for punitive damages, you can't just get the financial information. You have to actually uh, prove a prima facie case of um, gross negligence or different things that you can actually get punitive damages. But the point is they don't know what's going to be allowed and what's not going to be allowed. So I'm interested, interested to hear if either side mentions this in their opening statements. I don't think they will or if they talk about it with the jury at all before those witnesses are called to actually try to prove this motive in the state's case in chief. And the reason I don't think they're going to talk about it is because there were another set of motions that centered around a blood splatter expert. And we discussed that hearing already. We discussed um, some of the arguments the defense made. This person has been like disqualified or limited in other testimony the shirt isn't able to be tested by the defense yet. And basically, both sides have agreed that they are not going to mention the blood spatter expert in opening statements or until and if the state calls that witness. So what does that mean? That means potentially that the state might not call that witness. The state might not feel like it's necessary or this state attorney seems like a real straight shooter and maybe he just thinks it's not fair that the defense wasn't able to test it and he doesn't think the judge is going to allow them to put on testimony and not allow the defense experts to put on a testimony that their person couldn't have tested it or just make that argument to the jury saying, hey, we tried to test, uh, to test this T-shirt, but we weren't able to because after the state's guy tested it, it was not able to be tested anymore. I just said test about a million times there. So they're not going to discuss it. And we still don't know if that's going to come in. So we're not getting a lot of answers here in a lot of these pretrial motions. That's not unusual, but I hate that. As somebody who is an over-preparer, over-planner, a little OCD about this stuff, I would hate to have to wait for such large arguments. Now, sometimes there's a witness we don't know if they're going to testify or a specific topic. We don't know if this is going to come up or not. We're not going to talk about this in opening statements. That happens in almost every trial. But this seems like a bigger piece of evidence than should wait until the trial is going on. It also makes me think that... There are going to be a ton of stops in this trial. They discussed, if they do call this blood spatter expert, Murdoch's team's going to voir dire his expertise. They're going to talk about his opinions and how he got to those opinions. They're going to talk about his disqualifications. They're going to try to not allow him to testify, try to get a spoliation, basically um, limiting instruction on the t-shirt saying they weren't even able to test it. So all of that's going to happen in the middle of this trial. And I talked about this before. I've done literal expert depositions 
Daubert motions, Daubert challenges, and got an expert struck in the middle of a trial one time right after COVID because we actually had a day break in the middle of a week-long trial because defense attorney was getting his COVID shot. So we had to take a full day off, and that's when I was able to do this extra expert deposition that they were trying to bring in as an expert, and we ended up getting him disqualified. But this stuff happens in the middle of trials, and it's just wild to think of the life and the roller coaster of a trial in these circumstances. You also heard each side kind of make little side-eye jab type of deals at the other side delaying or untimely filing this discovery or untimely filing this motion just last night or just this mo this morning. And the defense is like, well, my motion was late because we didn't get the discovery till Friday. And obviously we're prepping for jury selection. So this was the earliest we could get this motion done. So that happened a few times just to understand the timeline of this case is difficult. Um, let's see what else we have here. They want to talk about third party guilt and other crimes or failing polygraph tests. Potentially. I think they're trying to, sometimes there's gamesmanship about if you call this witness, I might get into this trying to get them not to call the witness. I had a trial one time where the entire trial, the defense attorney's like, well, we're going to call this witness. If you don't call him, we're going to call him if you don't call him. And he was a good witness for us. And I was like, go ahead and call him. We don't feel like we need him. So I'm not going to call him because we don't want to bore the jury. If you call him, I'm going to drive a truck through it because he loves our client. He treated our client. He's a doctor of our client. So go ahead and call him if you want to. So sometimes there's that gamesmanship and guess what? The defense attorney never called him and neither did we. He wasn't necessary. Um, so sometimes there is some of that gamesmanship and it did seem like Murdoch's lawyers were doing a little bit of that about, you know, we might bring up the fact that they failed a polygraph, even though we know this stuff's not admissible. We're not just going to say polygraph though. We'll wait for the judge to make a decision. And then the biggest part that we're going to talk about and kind of focus on was this ballistics expert that was going to talk about in his general opinion. We're going to get to what his opinion actually was, but just to just simplify it for you. He's a government employee, um, law enforcement, quote unquote, expert on ballistics. And he was going to testify that the casings matched a gun that would have cycled the, the casings that were near the body of Murdoch's wife were cycled through the same firearm as the casings that were found in other parts of the multi thousand 1700 or something acre hunting grounds, probably from a gun Paul had one of which was missing. And it was a really interesting argument by the defense. There was a lot of questioning by the state. We'll go through kind of some of what the state said, and then I want to play a lot of the defense cross-examination when we actually got to what is your opinion and how certain are you of this opinion? We'll hear a little bit of argument by the state, and then we'll hear the judge's decision as to whether or not this expert will be able to testify so we can watch a little clip of it together because we are going to be doing that as we recap this trial. We'll play some clips from the trial. We'll answer a lot of questions. Um, but how does South Carolina look at experts? They don't have Daubert specifically, but their test is very similar to Daubert. And here are the four factors. The scientific methodology that the expert uses to get to their um, conclusion, is it peer-reviewed? Consideration of ge general acceptance, is this generally accepted in the scientific community? And the rate of error of a particular technique. They have to be acquired, this, the expert has to get their expertise acquired by study or practical experience, such as knowledge of a subject matter um, and training and experience like this law enforcement officer does have. So it's no surprise that most of the direct examination during um, this hearing, when they got this expert opinion, focused on the fact that they went through all of his training and, and experience. They talked about how his techniques are peer reviewed, generally accepted methodology. It's a scientific method. Um, the way we do things are so great. We have somebody look over it for us. I've testified about this stuff about 25 times. I've never had my testimony limited before. The uh, prosecutor makes the argument this has been used for literally hundreds of years as acceptable. The prosecutor was not at all nervous that the judge was going to cut this um, expert's testimony. The defense submitted some articles that they said disagreed or um, said that how this expert did this was wrong. And that's true. There are some articles on that, but they went through those articles with the expert and explained why those articles don't necessarily hold a lot of weight. Um, he maintains all of his accreditations. He takes classes. Um and basically, they went through the fact that this works under our standards, okay? And the cross-examination says, or they start the cross-examination about talking about what level of certainty, but we finally get to his opinion about two hours and 45 minutes in. And before we hear this, 
Let me go through some of the comments and questions here. Under Your Scars is a new member. Polar Wolf, Stephanie Montano, Jennifer Mitchell, Mike Christopher, Fabs, lots of new members, which is awesome. Uh, Life Tales with Mel, love the new office setup. It is far from done. And if you knew what it looked like around the camera right now, I mean, you can still say it looks awesome. John has done a great job, but he is driving me crazy with how it's all set up right now and what it looks like in my house. But hopefully we're able to simplify that. Cheryl likes it. Wow, your background is looking good. Love the blue. Yes, John is to thank for that. Uh, 877 Swiss Miss. Hi, brother. Look alike. Love your channel. So much to learn from you. Thank you. Uh, Don Jam Tal. I'm probably saying that wrong. If you can give me your pronunciation, maybe I'll be able to look at it. Is being dismissed for cause different than being selected? Yes. Being dismissed for cause means you're out on the case. If you're selected, then you're on the case. Or if you're selected at this point to be part of the qualified jurors, you're still in the running to be a juror on this case. Marty. Here, but might be hard between the 29th and the 8th as son-in-law will be staying with me from Portugal. He has a filming job here in the UK. So we'll miss some of them. So miss EV1. Hopefully you don't mean everyone, but that's awesome. What's up to your son-in-law? I want to buy that hoodie. So this was custom made by my mother-in-law. She has one of those things that can make these. And this was made for me for Christmas. So this one's not available. We're having issues with the store and people ordering hoodies and stuff. So we're trying to work on seeing if there's a good alternative. Um, so just know that we are working on that. Uh, T wild, a Buckingham. Hey fam, happy Tuesday. Someone please clarify for me. I get Murdoch equal Murdoch, but why does the media say Alec for Alex? Thanks. Hey, your guess is as good as mine. I'm doing my best. I read it as Alex Murdoch, right? But I've been trying to fix it to Alec Murdoch doing my best. Melanie C. Uhtred. So happy to catch you live. Thanks as always for your coverage. And thanks as always for blessing me with some of my favorite things that I've ever received from this channel with the Uhtred love. Tori, have to say, I love these nightly lives. Can we please keep these? Love the blue black, blue backlighting. Thank you for continuing to cover this trial. I'm here for it. OG crew here, and I'm ready for the Boone trial. Yes, during trials, as you know, Tori, we will do these nightly recaps. The other time, it's easier for me to do as much as I can at the office, just schedule-wise, but I want to get these recaps in as much as I can while this stuff is going on. Editor Daniel Marie Great recap as always, watching with my parents in South Carolina. It seems like it's wild there. Let me know. Is it as wild as everybody's saying? Serena, and it's just ramping up. Why doesn't the prosecution and defense both agree on and choose expert witnesses together to avoid having a witness that could be biased towards the side that hired them? Well, this would be nice if everybody could play nice in the sandbox, but instead, we all hire expert witnesses that give us the opinions that we like. I mean, frankly, that's what it comes down to. And I don't say that we you know, say go through 15 expert witnesses, but usually we know a certain expert witness has a reputation for testifying this way. Like this guy said, he's testified in 25 trials. We know what his testimony is. So when the state hires him, they kind of know how he's going to get to where he's going to get. And that's really, and a lot of this is done before they even charge him. And before we get this far down the line, especially for a state attorney's office or a prosecuting attorney's office, I should say. Um, so it's not a surprise. And I mean, sides and civil criminal doesn't matter. They can almost never agree on an expert. The only time you ever really see it is in, in, a, in a Florida case and not guilty by reason of insanity. A lot of times all the experts will agree, um, which is why a judge will then rule that they're not guilty. Uh, J.R. Cuber, Rebecca Adams, and Janet G. are all new members, as well as Justin Lyons and Lori K. Thank you for this super sticker, and I'll leave this up as we get to the testimony here. So this is the ballistics expert right here. And you're about to see attorney Griffin, I believe is his last name. And he is going to, he's in the middle of his cross-examination. So we kind of skipped ahead of this part so we can get to what your testimony actually is and how certain are you of this testimony? I'll skip around a little bit to some of the boring parts, but I want to listen and see what you guys think about how confident you think this expert is because the, the, um, standard is a reasonable degree of scientific probability or scientific certainty. That's the standard yet. Let me know how confident does this expert seem when we're listening to this lawyer question him the cartridge. So what, 
what level of certainty do you have as to the fact that, in your opinion, that items two through seven were loaded into, extracted, and ejected from the same firearm at some previous time as items 35 through 37, 39, 108, 113, 116 through 17, and 122? What's your level? So let me back that up, actually. let's We'll slow it down here. Listen to it on normal speed, and I'll just skip through the boring stuff. What level of certainty do you have as to the fact that, in your opinion, that items two through seven were loaded into, extracted, and ejected from the same firearm at some previous time as items 35 through 37, 39, 108, 130? So the first items were the casings that were by Murdoch's wife's body, and these casings were ones that were found elsewhere on the hunting grounds, and he was saying they were cycled through the same weapon, which would mean what the state's trying to prove with this is, even though we don't have the weapon, this is one of the Murdoch weapons. This was somewhere on the hunting grounds and shot in the past on the hunting grounds, and Murdoch used one of his own weapons here for this murder. That's what the state's trying to do, connecting these dots. 13, 116 through 17, and 122. What's your level of certainty? Um, that is my conclusion. Um, after I examined the evidence, I arrived at that conclusion um, based on um, the... How certain are you? That is my conclusion, and I arrived at that conclusion after weighing all the evidence. So he's not actually answering how certain he is, but the defense attorney keeps asking. Years of extensive um, training, looking at thousands of comparisons and um, basing that conclusion upon that. Um, if I thought um, it could have been a different answer, um, there, I, it could have been inconclusive, but I was able to determine that the agreement that I saw on those items was su uh, sufficient enough to uh, determine that they had been cycled through um, the same firearm at some previous time. Okay, so... He said he could have come to the conclusion that it was inconclusive, and he didn't. That's about as far as he went, that it was co conclusive enough for him to come to that opinion. That's basically, that's basically as far as he was willing to take it. Do you hold that opinion with a reasonable degree of scientific certainty? Um, it's my opinion so that— Most jurisdictions are it's now scientific probability, but still, he asks it as specific as he can, based on the standard in South Carolina, um, reasonable scientific certainty— and he does not say yes to that. He could, and as we'll hear later, doesn't really matter, but he doesn't. I give him credit for sticking to the fact that he is not certain. He's not even reasonably certain about this, so I give him credit. He seems like a very honest guy. And that those um, had matching mechanism marks. Well, it's, they have matching, matching mechanism marks, but are you able to state with a reasonable degree of scientific certainty that only one weapon in the entire universe would have produced those matching marks? Um, based on um, all of the, the markings and tool marks and cartridge case and fire bullets that I've looked at in my career, I have um, examined and conducted thousands of comparisons. Um, I've con participated in, in studies and competencies that, in which I look at things to determine if they were fired by a particular firearm. and. Um, and, and able to um, build a foundation in which I can um, base my opinion. And it's, it's my opinion that based on that training, based on those studies I participated in, um, some of those included um, consecutively rifle barrels, consecutively manufactured slides, and I successfully passed those, um, that based on the information there, after I examined those cartridge cases um, for those markings, it's my opinion that those items um, all had shared matching uh, mechanism marks and uh, have been loaded into extracted or ejected from the same firearm at some previous time. There's no doubt this guy is an expert. The defense didn't even, even object when the state wanted to qualify him as an expert. And there's no doubt that he believes that there, these markings do show that they were cycled through. So it's kind of interesting that he wouldn't say he's certain. Now, I will say, Ashley said he did say he's certain. So I could have missed it, but I, I've listened to this multiple times, and I don't think he ever says he's certain. He just basically says that's his opinion. Um, Tory said, this process makes all the witnesses have to present their case two times. Is that right? No, only certain witnesses where there's an issue about their case, do they have to proffer kind of what they would testify to at trial? Or if it's an expert, you can have a kind of Daubert hearing, which is kind of what this is, where the expert has to come, be questioned, be cross-examined, and see if what they're going to say is actually admissible and allowed to come in. Marty was saying that, she will miss everyone here. It'll be hard to watch the lives while here. 
Totally understand it. Call me Bish. Hey, I'm here for however you're pronouncing names. Dude, lights are very nice. Uh, send your flags in the chat. Diverse group, we are. Okay. Let's keep listening. Are you aware of any studies that, that have ever been done on a, on a 300 blackout? 300 blackout is, is a newer caliber. Um, I'm sh not aware at this point in time. I'm sure there may have been research, but I do not have um, research with me today um, on cartridge cases of that caliber. Sounds like a no to me. You know, he's like, have you ever done this on a 300 black or 30 black? I don't even know what this gun is. If I'm being honest, I'm not the ballistics expert clearly. Um, and he says, I'm sure I have, but I'm not sure, you know, if I did specifically or whatever, it's kind of a newer gun and they get into that. And again, these are really good arguments. They don't end up carrying the day. I'll spoiler alert here, but the defense attorney is making very pointed arguments and we're going to hear the judges ruling at the end, but the defense attorney is going to be able to use these points to cross examine 300 blackout. Is that what it is? Sorry. Um, so Janae, so this testimony doesn't even count. It does count in determining whether or not this guy's even going to testify. Now, will the testimony at trial be exactly the same as this? Absolutely not. The defense attorney will ask less open-ended questions. It'll be more pointed questions. They will get their point across at trial that this is unreliable. What they're trying to do now is poke holes in the Daubert argument that it's not a reasonably to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty. That's what they're trying to argue to the judge because that's the standard. When they're arguing to a jury, you'll notice and remember once we listen to these questions that they are instead going to argue this is just not reliable. You can't trust this. There are, there's these other peer-reviewed articles that say the way that you do this is kind of junk science. This isn't based on a scientific method. This is just based on you know a, a human and what a human thinks when they look at it and things like that. So there are different angles when this proffered testimony versus what actually comes out at trial because there are different uses for it um, in front of a jury versus in front of the judge from both sides, from the prosecution and the defense. Are you familiar with how 300 blackout is manufactured? Um, with basic um, manufacturing processes, uh, yes, sir, I suppose so. Right. And so, um, and, and in fact, you know, some company or, or gunsmith will assemble a 300 blackout from component parts. Uh, using uh, the the various component parts that are mass produced, is that correct? Are we t are talking about component parts of the rifle? Yes, sir. Um, different uh, manufacturers choose to uh, make or uh, make their parts, or they can have those um, supplied by other vendors. Yes, sir. I suppose so. Do you, do you know how the 300... So again, and so he's talking a little bit about trying to say, like, you don't really understand this 300 blackout, whatever. Um, and Jeannie Jones, yes, this is the kind of gun that we're talking about that these bullets were cycled through. So if you can make the expert seem like he doesn't know what he's talking about with this specific gun and all the testing he's done with other guns, again, you all tell me. How reasonable is that? Do you think this attorney is poking holes in this expert's expertise or would you believe his opinion? He gave his opinion... He's not necessarily certain, like Don says. Instead of saying he's certain, he's, he tries qualifying his answer with his training. Exactly. And if a jury buys it and they believe because of his training, they're going to trust him. And just because he may not know specifically about this gun or just because there are some of these other studies, he has more studies that are with him because he does. He has peer-reviewed articles that agree with this methodology. So how would you balance that as potential jurors? Because you... Oh, 300 blackout is ammo? I thought it sounded like it was gun. Oh, 300 blackout is a type of ammo used in air type rifles. Okay, that's how little I know about this. Okay, so when we're talking about this ammo or this gun or whatever, if the lawyers can make it seem like the expert doesn't know about the gun that was used, about the ammo that was used, do you think that's enough to make you say, I don't understand this argument? Um, this isn't going to be something that holds a lot of water to me, which is really important because they don't have the murder weapon in this case but they do have these casings that they're saying are matching other casings on the hunting property. Well, you know how any of the 300 blackouts that Mr. Murdoch purchased for his son, Paul, um, were manufactured, where they were purchased, how they were assembled. Um, I do not have information as to how they were purchased or assembled. Okay. Uh, are you familiar with production lots? 
how, say, rifle barrels are produced in a production line. We don't have to go through all this. We'll kind of skip through some of this. This is funny. About half of you were saying, I didn't like this expert at all. Half of you were saying he's really smart. I do agree with him. I do think what he says, uh, this stuff that he's kind of poking holes in don't matter. Then you have Kevin Burnett, who's like, peer-reviewed so-called studies are BS. You are right. And I actually had an expert one time try to tell me that a paper he wrote in his like PhD program that was peer reviewed by his professor who that's also known as grading uh, your paper, tried to use that as peer review for his articles. 90% of his testimony was struck in a case that I had in federal court. And the judge basically stopped me, sat me down, was like, Mr. Tragos, figure out when you're ahead and sit down. And I sat down and she's like, you're not testifying to any of that. Like the fact that your professor graded your paper does not make it a peer reviewed article, but Kevin's kind of right in, in certain things where what you call something peer reviewed can be kind of fudged um, here and there. All right, let's get through some mass of this. studies that, that have concluded that produce. Um, I am familiar with I've all heard of requirements that are manufactured in the manufacturing design of that are shaped. What about, a, I guess, what do you call the inside of a uh, the barrel of? Of a pistol or rifle, correct? Uh, yes, sir. That would be the bore of the barrel. The bore of the barrel. Um, are you familiar with any studies uh, with regard to what you relied upon here, which would be extractor and ejector marks? Um, yes, sir. I believe there are studies um, that have have shown um, the reproducibility um, of those markings and how uh, firearms examiners were able to distinguish between. Um, those those manufactured um, components. And are you familiar with any studies of the component parts that were used in uh, 300 blackouts? Um, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Are you familiar with any studies that were done on, on the extractor and ejector component parts that are used in a 300 blackout assembly? Um, I don't have any information with me today in regards to the 300 blackout. Um, so that's an interesting, and, and multiple times he said, I don't have information with me today. I'm not positive about this. Um, I have to go back and look and see if I have that. And that's really important because that's another reason that this proffer situation is really important. I've had cases where I've learned a ton during proffer testimony when that person was allowed in. And I totally changed the way I was going to question them based on the answers they gave in the proffer. And we'll see at the end of this questioning, what this defense attorney does that is really smart because now you have this under oath testimony so that if he doesn't go and do what the defense attorney asked him to do, he'll be able to kind of make him look bad. So I will, uh, let me show you this real quick just to make this point. Um, but all those components are machined in similar ways. Um, they may not I guess, spent. I would, those are the right turn items that you say match. That's counting. Um, all my training experience today, whether a pattern exists. Uh, no, the uh, of your conclusions before they review? Uh, no, sir. Um, okay, so this we is have an interesting. So this is an interesting conversation that they're going to have now. Um, they're talking about how somebody reviewed his report, not knowing his conclusions, and came to the same conclusion. And they're confirming that he didn't know what you already said. And this is interesting too, because you know. How do you think things work in an office? Did they talk about it before? Did they not? Um, we're going to take him at his word. He's under oath that this was a total blind, double basic analysis here. Um, and let, let's hear some interesting things happen. And again, defense attorneys are learning things here. This is a speedy trial. Discovery was very short. They're learning a lot here. And you can tell as you listen. The blind verification process. Um, so they do not know our results. And who reviewed your work and... Um, the analysis in this case, that's court's exhibit number one. Um, the reviewer for this case was uh, Chad Smith. Does okay. his name appear on this report that I'm overlooking? Um, his name would not appear on the report um, as I'm the one issuing the report. Um, his name would be included in the case file documenting his agreement with my conclusions. Okay. And you're saying Mr. Smith would not have available to him your conclusions before he looked at, at, at the jail case issue. That's correct. So he did a report. And as you can see, the defense attorney is like, well, we don't have that. And we'll hear them ask for that later and hear what the prosecution says kind of in response. Thank you, Justin, and everybody that's explaining this to me because I don't really know much about guns or ammo.
So pre, what's interesting is I've seen different definitions for what peer review actually means depending on the jurisdiction and what who external experts would be. I mean, lawyers literally argue about everything, right? They argue about everything. So it's not as simple as it may seem um, when you talk about uh, peer reviewed. And yes, Ashley said it was double blind, actually. Um, yes, that's where we're at right now. Marty, do you think there will be jury questions in this trial? There's no telling. I don't know what this jurisdiction allows. So it really depends on if this jurisdiction allows it. Uh, Diana, yay, always the best days when I can catch a live. Brooke, question, can they bring that person in that reviewed to testify? Yes. Yes, they can. I don't think the defense would want to. So the state probably couldn't because it may be two experts with the same specialty, with the same opinion, but the defense potentially could if they thought there'd be some impeachment there or some, something that they could gain from calling them. Now, can you say, um, well, let me ask you, have you ever rendered opinion in court that, that you have here today that just looking at spent shell casings with, without having a, a firearm to test that they came from the same firearm? Uh, I believe I have. Yes, sir. Uh, you more than once. I'm, I'm unable to, re, uh, to recall about how many reports I've issued based on the cycling marks. Um, I believe I've, I have issued a report like that in the past um, where I was able to, to look at those, um, those cartridge cases, and I don't remember the, uh, the details of the case, whether there was a gun involved or not. So I'm, I'm asking, actually testified in a court of law, not just issuing a report. You recall ever offering testimony in a court of law that, that you have here today that just looking at spent shell casings on tool mechanisms that you've concluded they were fired from the same way. I'm, I've testified in court approximately 25 times regarding my uh, conclusions. Um, in regards just to if you're discussing mechanism marks, I would have to, to recall and check um, a file. I don't know off the top of my head, um, but I have testified in court approximately 25 times um, to my conclusions that I've issued in a report in regards to firearm and tool mark identification. And earlier you're talking about reports. How many times do you think you've ever issued a report where you concluded just based upon your analysis of the spent name? Well, I'm an, our ultimate goal is um, the spent shell casings with item 33. Is that correct? <laughs> Uh, yes, sir. Item 33 was the rifle. And, and that was the rifle provided to you. Um, were you aware that that rifle was purchased about the same time as another rifle for Sun Paul um, and that was stolen? I, I don't know the history of, of these rifles or how they were uh, presented uh, by the PCAST report. The, uh, another criticism that we've cited is that, that your They're field relies on training articles. and experience. They're and going you... through the articles that criticize kind of his uh, way of doing things. Chris said it is simple, simple Peter. Law is so corrupted. Chris, I mean, listen, there are different ways to look at everything. And the way I would say it is it's not law that's corrupted. In my opinion, lawyers hold people's feet to the fire and hold people accountable. That's really what we're supposed to do. And that's, it's the same thing with like, we wouldn't have seatbelts without personal injury lawyers, right? Safety measures are put in place. We wouldn't have warning labels if it wasn't for lawyers. Um, and a lot of people's rights would be violated if it wasn't for lawyers. So if somebody said that they were an expert or they had an expert peer reviewed it, you would want your lawyer to dig in and see, is this person actually an expert in what they say they are? And is this legitimate? And if it is fine, but you would want your lawyer to question that if there is an issue, uh, Wolfie's angel. Wow. So let's just cross examine an expert to see if he's reliable. Absolutely. How else would you know he's reliable? Do you know how many people are self-proclaimed experts in some field? This is the only way really we can see, are they an expert as the law defines one? And I think that's a really important part of this process that we're, will, that we're able to see parts of here in this hearing. CMS. Hey, Peter, today was the first time I read about the Snapchat evidence other than someone from Snapchat being called to testify. I didn't find any specifics. I'm wondering what you think and know. I didn't, I must have missed that. I didn't see the Snapchat evidence. Are you talking about this case? Are you talking about the Idaho case? I'm not positive CMS. Uh, Maria, would it be so, I'm sorry, would it be odd if he comes back to testify and is surprisingly very knowledgeable about the, what the 300 blackout is, or is it okay since he is an expert witness? I'm glad you asked Maria. And I'm going to leave this comment on the screen as we kind of listen to what this lawyer says at the end. And uniqueness in lieu of empirical demonstration of accuracy. And, and that would happen here. You use your training and experience and there's no objective standard for measuring against whether there's a pattern or not. Is that fair? Um, there are, we do our, use our training and experience. That is um, correct. We rely on I think in our engineering, um, where you can just launch training, they have to um, it, Would you uh, consider that to look at these, them all peaks and ridges and furrows, some items, ladder, in some objective. Two, two other questions for you. One, if, if you have the opportunity between now and you testify, will you research to see if you can find any studies where 300 blackout uh, tool marks have been tested to determine whether one 300 blackout produces tool mechanisms unique every other 300 blackout in the world? Would you mind doing that? Um, yes, sir. I will look into the literature. Um, again, um, based on. So, Maria. That answers your question right there, right? Will you go and look and see if you can find any 
uh, peer reviewed articles or literature talking about this 300 blackout ammo in a situation and how you are discussing it. So he wants him to go do research about this 300 blackout ammo. He wants him to go do research and see if anybody has done something similar to what he's doing in this case, because it seems like the defense attorneys feel like the answer to that is no. And right now, this expert can kind of be like, eh, I'm not really sure. I haven't looked specifically for that. But now that they have asked the expert to specifically look for that, if the expert comes back during trial and still says, yeah, I don't know, I couldn't get to it. It's like, I just questioned you under oath on Tuesday, January 24th. Isn't that correct? And I asked you specifically if you would go back and look into this, and you didn't. And I would follow up with, that's because there aren't any. Are there Mr. whatever his name is, officer whatever his name is? So this is an interesting part of the process as well, and learning during this proffered testimony. Great question, Maria. On firearm and tool mark identification, there's been hundreds and hundreds of studies throughout the years um, that demonstrate um, the reliability of our, of our field and produce those um, error rates to help us go by that we can fall under. Um, and so knowing the machining and manufacturing process of some of those components, um, we can't possibly look at every firearm to in the world to compare that to. However, knowing how those um, guns are machined and taking that information and applying it to the different components and different firearms, those techniques would carry over um, based on the literature that's been proven. Yes, sir. I'm asking about 300 blackouts, but if you want to do AR-15s, that's okay. And, and then uh, if you don't mind checking your files to see how many times you've issued reports where you just have shell casings and you've concluded that one single weapon was responsible for extracting and ejecting the shell casings. Lawyers like this ask questions like this because they feel like they know the answer. And they feel like, my guess is, they have a lot of his other testimony, whether it's 20 or 25 or whatever it is, and he's never rendered an opinion similar to this. That's the, that's the vibe I'm picking up if I was a juror and, he, and this lawyer was asking this question, but that's because I do this and I cross-exam people and this is what I would do if I feel like I knew the answer and they were kind of wiggling around is, I'm not really sure I haven't looked into everything. It's like, that's because there isn't any, is there? And you're not sure if you've testified like this. Actually, the expert said he did testify like that, but maybe um, it's because those lawyers think he didn't. Would you get that vibe if you were a juror or would you just believe the expert and be like, these lawyers are just trying to argue just to argue, which some of you have said, that's very fair. And if a juror feels that way, it's not going to be very um, effective. Yes, sir. I'll, I'll see if I can gather that information. Thank you, sir. Of course, ultimately, you heard that they did not take into account the full theory of identification. So this is just the state making an argument before the judge makes a decision. So we'll listen to a little bit of the argument. I really just want to hear the judge make the call. Um, and then we'll kind of hear the end when they say, so where's this report? Where's this blind second report that agreed with this expert? Because we've never seen it, the defense says. Identification, which is the basis for this particular science. Um, there was certainly some cross-examination about uh, 300 blackout and, and that sort of thing. Uh, but you heard from Agent Greer that 300 blackout is a, the ammunition is made from common components. And with the, uh, he mentioned also the AR-15. We are talking about matching uh, whether or not a particular round was cycled through a weapon. Well, the receivers in these weapons, again, there's a standard uh, component processor to that. So there still is recognized studies there. And it doesn't change the fact that 300 blackout is a commonly, is manufactured from commonly made components, much like 223 or other rounds. There's nothing fundamentally different about that. Uh, Your Honor, uh, if you look at all those various factors uh, for the council uh, hearing, uh, I believe that they're all established uh, in, uh, in great um, uh, degree. And I think ultimately what we've heard today uh, is the fundamental aspect of weight and admissibility. Uh, certainly the defense can cross-examine. They can raise these issues. They can raise criticisms of the science. Uh, but it's been more than established that uh, we would uh, submit for admissibility into this trial. Thank you, Your Honor. By the defense. Yes, Your Honor, um, the standard for admissibility of expert opinion is the expert has to hold the opinion with a reasonable degree of scientific certainty, whatever the field is. Uh, Mr. Greer, Agent Greer, was unable to testify. He would not testify that he held his opinion to a reasonable degree of certainty. Uh, and he had to concede that there are no studies to support his opinion that, that even AR-15 or 300 blackout, uh, the, the mechanisms that he relied upon, that they were unique, uniqueness. And so those are, you know, the, the case law that we rely upon, you know, addresses that, particularly when it gets to the level of certainty of the expert to say it came from this particular weapon. Um, the cases that we cited in our brief reject that. I know there's, there's some contrary law cited by the state, but the basis of his opinion is, here is simply his experience, as explained by Mr. Waters, of testing um, – Rifle bores and handgun bores. And we are not talking about markings on a projectile that went through a rifle or handgun bore. We're talking about ejector marks from when, when a, a, a bullet or a shell casing is ejected from a weapon. And that um, is a bridge too far. Thank you. I find that the state has met the requirement of admissibility under Rule 702 and 703 of the South Carolina Rules. Of Nobody is surprised at this. We didn't listen to it, but the state said for hundreds of years, judges, literally, this has been allowed. The judge agrees.
of evidence as well as under uh, State v. Counsel, uh, find that the uh, evidence proposed will assist the jury in understanding an issue in the case. The witness is well qualified and that the underlying science is reliable. The um, matters at issue involving this witness uh, will be matters for cross-examination and for the jury to determine its weight. Uh, though the witness did not state that specifically that he holds this opinion to the reasonable degree of um, scientific certainty, uh, of course, if thoroughly held in, in numerous cases that there are no magic words that are necessary for an understanding as to the um, opinion and the level of certainty that a witness has. And AKA, he said he was certain without saying he was certain, right? He said it without saying it because you don't have to use those magic words. It's interesting though, he was asked specifically those magic words. It seems like he was told not to say he was certain or he's even reasonably certain. And as we expected and as we expect this to happen and somebody asked... Uh, Brooke Smith question, would you, or do you think the defense will go this hard on this expert in front of the jury? Yes. And the judge just said, all this stuff you brought up is totally fair game for cross-examination. If you want to talk about how he's not reasonably certain, reasonably certain, if you want to talk about those other articles, if you want to talk about how this is just ammo that he's not familiar with, go for it. That goes to the weight that goes to whether or not the jury is going to believe it or buy it or think it's credible. But as far as the legal standard and somebody else asked, uh, Melanie said, Uhtred, you're so welcome. But what is Daubert? Daubert is a case that we get our expert standard from. We have Daubert hearings. That's the, the factors that I read you earlier about, you know, is it peer reviewed? Is it generally accepted? That's called Daubert. It's a short term uh, that we use when talking about expert testimony. I should have explained that though. So thank you for, thank you for catching me. And offering an opinion. Uh, so the witness was firm in his opinion based on his years of experience and training. And I find that the, uh, the findings indicated in um, states, of course, exhibit number one uh, is admissible. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, can we ask uh, that the state produce the reviewer's report if it exists? And the expert testified that there was a blind review and, and that it matched his, and we would ask that it that would fall under Rule 5. As totally fair, in my opinion. They should have already turned it over. Results of a test. <laughs> Uh, Your Honor, we've produced the entire uh, case notes and case file. I will double check with the agents, and if there's something else, uh, we're certainly happy to make that available. Well, the witness said he, that it would be indicated in the reviewer's report. I think he said that. And so, the judge said, witness seemed to say it exists. So if it exists, you've got to produce it for the defense. They've got to be able to see it. Maybe they'll want to call that person as a witness. It be in the case notes that have already been provided, but we will double check. And, and if there's something that hasn't been provided, I would be surprised if that's the case, but we'll certainly rectify that if that's the case. All right. Anything else today? And that's it. That's all they did today. So that's interesting to see if that report actually exists and what information is it? Did he do things differently? Did he come to the same exact conclusion? Did he get there the same way? Very interesting. Uh, Bonita Bruner is, or Brunner, is a new member. Sincerely special. Hello there. Uh, Christy Ellis is a new member. And Devin Broyles is also a new member. Be Happy said, this lawyer reminded me of Elaine from the H and JD trial. I think that's a slight. Um, I could be wrong, but I think that's a slight. I did. I disagree. I think he did a pretty good job. When you know you're going to lose an argument and you go in and question a witness, sometimes you lose and you just lose because the law is not on your side, but you still get a lot of good information out of it. And I think he did. Cerebellum, baby is going through leap for sleep regression. Got to run. Have a great evening, everyone. Thank you, Peter. Godspeed to you, Cerebellum. Uh, Karen, the Snapchat was sent by Paul just prior to the murder. That is all they've revealed. So sad. And then somebody else said, uh, the son, Paul, uh, this is from Don, sent out a Snapchat video to friends minutes before he was killed. The prosecution say it's a critical part of the case. Wow. So I wonder if the Snapchat reveals like, hey, dad just showed up, gotta go, or something like that when you know he has this alibi. Um, military wholesome for Hogue. The Bolt Carrier Group is the same for a 300 AAC blackout as it is for a standard 556 NATO 223 REM round, meaning the specificity of the 300 blackout the defense is bringing up is moot. That's kind of what I figured uh, militantly, but I got to be honest with you. It sounds like you're speaking a different language, and some people were talking about maybe these defense lawyers just trying to confuse a jury. That's possible. Um, to me, they did make it seem like it was different, but... Maybe the state has another expert to be like, this stuff is all the same. We don't have to test every, you know, just because you get, uh, what, what was the, the 
you know, Pepsi Cola or no, what was it called? What is that? RC Cola versus Pepsi. It's like, you don't have to try every single one. They're pretty similar, even though they're not, but maybe that was a bad analogy. <laughs> okay. Houston. My neighborhood was hit by a tornado today. Baytown, Texas, but grateful for the live, the live to be entertained. Thank you. I'm so sorry to hear that. I haven't, I haven't heard about that or seen that um, at all. Well, I'm glad you're with us. Jeepers. Totally off topic, but you look like a younger Johnny Depp so much tonight. Are you wearing guy liner? Sorry, I'm just enthralled with your eyes. I've only worn guy liner uh, two times, and those are the two times I dressed up as Captain Jack Sparrow. Be kind. This expert is going to be looking at lots of things. The defense lawyer gave him a map as to what to look into to have more concise info to give. I think the defense is also practicing how to muddy this testimony up for the jury. I will tell you, I don't think the defense lawyers were giving this expert the roadmap to go do the research. I think this expert knows way more than anybody else about this topic already. And the reason that he doesn't know certain things that the defense lawyers are bringing up is because I don't think it maybe exists. This 300 blackout or whatever seems like it's new. And maybe they're just, it hasn't been around long enough for there to be these studies on it. And maybe it hasn't been enough cases for this expert to have testified about it specifically. So they want this expert to say, no, actually, there are no um, articles specifically talking about this. But the expert, as he did throughout his testimony and as militantly just explained to us, that doesn't matter that I haven't looked at 300 blackout specifically. JC is a new member. Militantly wholesome for Hogue. Just to clarify, the bolt carrier group is what houses the extractor and ejector, which is what they were talking about with the cycled shell casings. So it's people like you as to why we need experts and people to come to trial and actually explain this stuff and not leave it up to the lawyers. Because the lawyers can understand how to use and connect dots and use this information, but to explain it, we need you to translate for us and this expert. And I actually think, I, I, I hope for the prosecution's sake, that the expert does a little bit better of a job explaining some of this at trial during cross-examination, like B. Kind said, maybe he'll go do some research. Stephen Road, love your channel. Thanks for being here. Uh, so much feedback from the marketing person, which would be John. Your intro is insightful questions and answers. Insightful questions by default aren't insightful. Thank you again. Okay. Uh, Char Baron, thank you for the super sticker. And Meg Magruder is a new member. Um, will the defense question this from Mary Green, the jury about bullet and gun knowledge? That's one of the things I mentioned yesterday that I think they'll question them on. Who knows about this stuff? Um, they'll think about who their perfect juror is and they'll try to ask those questions and build charts based on based on age and income sometimes uh, jury consultants can find and what types of job you've had and have you ever been arrested before and um, have you ever been on a jury before and if you have, have you gotten to a verdict? Because sometimes defense attorneys like jurors that don't get to verdicts because they can be holdouts and there could be a hung jury in this trial, things like that. So it, it is pretty interesting when we talk about um, who your perfect juror is for this case because every team of lawyers, whether it's civil, whether it's criminal, whether it's defense, whether it's plaintiff, whether it's prosecution, they talk about who their perfect juror is and that's really what they're looking for throughout the jury process. It is very interesting and very different when a judge controls the jury selection process versus the lawyers. I much prefer the lawyers controlling it. I feel like we have a much better handle on who our jury is. Um, a lot of times in federal court, I don't feel like I know my jurors and state court, I feel like I know them pretty well, regardless of whether I think they're you know, going to be good or bad or like my client or not like my client. I kind of know where they're coming from because of all of our questions. So uh, that, that's pretty interesting to me to, to actually be able to handle the process on our own. Uh, Myra, hell yeah, late night lives. You're on my time now, Peter. Yeah, honestly, it's, what is it? It's only 9.30 here. It's getting late for me. It's feeling pretty late. All right, a couple more um questions and then we're going to take off. We've got about two or three more minutes. Pat, what is up for tomorrow? Yes. What is next? 11 a.m. The jurors are reporting. They are going to continue with jury selection. Now, I think it was somebody from law and crime or court TV or something that reported that the lawyers are not asking questions. They're just submitting questions to the judge and the judge is going to ask questions, um, which is interesting to me because multiple times the judge said the lawyers have more questions for you. The lawyers will follow up with you. 
So it seems like it's been indicating that the lawyers are going to ask questions, but everybody's telling me it's going to be the judge. So we'll wait and see. I think it would be more interesting if the lawyers ask the questions. I think we'd find out more information if the lawyers ask the questions. Um, I don't know if um, they're going to, when we've done that in federal court before, which is the only court I've ever had to have the judge control in every state court I've ever tried a case in, I've been able to do it myself or with the lawyers. Um, but we submit a list of questions before the trial ever starts with the judge. The judge asks some questions, not others. And then at certain points, the judge comes up and says, is there any other questions you want me to ask? And I'm like, yes, judge, I'd like you to ask about the cap on damages. And they'll say, I'm not asking that. So that's just kind of what happens sometimes where the judge will say, uh, no, I'm not going to ask that question. And sometimes you don't get to ask a lot of questions that you want to ask as a lawyer. Uh, 10 a.m. Central, 11 Eastern. Yes, I should have said 11 Eastern. So we have 2,500 people in the chat. Hopefully we have 2,500 likes on the video. If you haven't hit that like button, hit the like button so we can get up to 2,500 likes. Um, if you haven't subscribed yet, hit that subscribe button so we can hit 190K at some point in the next day or two and continue our grind to 200K. Uh, Steven, so random and not your field, but do states ever consider, if you will, the ROI on trying and retrying cases? I mean... Are you talking about like state attorney's offices? There's no ROI, right? There's not a lot of ROI except when you talk about public safety and how can you put a number on public safety? Because that's really what it comes down to is you'll spend as much money as you can, especially the public's money to keep the public safe. Um, nobody likes trying these cases multiple times. Uh, John O'Rourke, I feel like this dude jumped around the questions purposely. Is that a possibility? Are you talking about, if you're talking about the expert, I do feel like he qualified all of his answers, but a lot of experts do that. And I don't fault him for it, um, for saying like, I'm basing this off my training and experience. I'm not going to say I'm certain, um, not just answering yes or no. It's very common for experts, especially when he says stuff like, you've never done this on a 300 blackout, have you? Just like militantly said, if this was my expert, I would expect and force the fact that do not just say yes to that. Explain why it doesn't matter that you haven't done this on a 300 blackout. That's what's really important. And experts have to explain their answers a lot. LMM, what's your opinion on the Alex Jack Alex Jackson case? I have not seen anything about the Alex Jackson case. I'm being honest. Um, I haven't seen it at all. There has been more going on with the few cases that we are covering. Um, and to me, it's really tough to even jump on any other cases at this point. Um all right, let's see. The, the expert avoided perjuring himself. I don't know if I'd go that far. Um, is the son testifying for or against him? I'm not positive how a lot of this evidence is going to come out. Because it's been so quick and the reporting has not been, um, we haven't gotten a ton of, of what's going to happen. And a lot of the evidence that we think is going to come in, the judge hasn't even made a decision on yet. So I'm kind of waiting to see what actually comes out at trial. That's what I'm really waiting to see here for this case. All right. Indiana versus Alex Jackson. A lot of people saying he's very guilty. I'm not positive. Um, yeah, Sinbad, I think we are going to go to the subs only chat here as the trial continues to deal with that issue. Steven, what about your job? Being an attorney gets you out of bed in the morning. Must love, most love about the field. So what do I love? So, so if you're talking about retrying cases and return on investment, it really depends. If we go lose and we can appeal and retry the case, then obviously if it's worth it. Um, if we have a mistrial, it sucks and it is not worth it, but we don't have a choice because we didn't get a verdict. And in my line of work, we get a piece of whatever the verdict is or whatever the settlement is. So the client's not paying us hourly. We're in it together. If they win, we win. So it's absolutely worth it to keep going and trying it until we get what we think is fair compensation for our client. Um, but what gets me out of bed in the morning, I love the problem solving. I love negotiating. I like leverage. I like talking through things. I like arguing a point. I like proving a point. I like winning an argument. I like presenting. I love presenting. That's what I really like about trial. I like jury selection a lot. I like closing arguments a lot, cross-examining witnesses. It's it's just, it's an adrenaline rush. It's like, I'm a I'm big into sports. I love playing sports. I was never good enough to like play in college or be a professional athlete or anything like that. But this feels like professional sports to me when we try cases and we negotiate these serious catastrophic injury cases with adjusters and defense lawyers. 
Um, that's what gets me out of bed in the morning and that's what keeps me doing it. And I do love it. Um, okay. We have hit the one hour mark. I appreciate everybody joining in here, uh, for another live. Let me know if you have any questions in the chat. If you're part of the rewatch crew, hit that like button on the way out. Thank you, Emily. We will go out on your super sticker. You guys are the best. Thanks so much for joining me tonight. Until next time, I'm out of here. Oh, tomorrow, Elizabeth Holmes. Did she try to flee? Pete did a video and it's dropping tomorrow. So if you're into that case, make sure you check that out and you can subscribe and hit that reminder bell so you'll get the notification when that video posts. I'm out of here. Take it easy.